As we're now entering into a new season, um, it's a season we call Lent. And Lent is a season of new beginnings. It's a season in which um, God takes us on a journey of our faith, where we discover what it means to be recreated. We discover what it means to be resurrected people. And something that I recall now as when I was a youngster in high school, something that in a way dates me, of course, but also it was just that particular slice of time for me in which I found myself at night, at the night when my folks flipped on the evening news about that time about the nightly news, kind of that late, it was time to go to bed, it was time to kind of get away and quiet away a bit, but I didn't like the evening news at all, really, so I just went into my bedroom, and, and there I had a radio, because I didn't have a television in those times in my bedroom, and I didn't have a personal computer there in the bedroom either, so, but I did have this little plastic box of a radio, and, and I'd flip it on, and so I would listen, I would listen to that radio program in the quiet, in the shadows of my room at night. E.G. Marshall, the mystery theater. The sound of suspense, he would say, the fear you can hear. It was the squeaking of the door at the end of the show, going shut. The cryptic sound that was there, and the classic sign-off. Until next time, pleasant dreams, he would say. <laughs> pleasant dreams. I could have anything but pleasant dreams after listening to the radio mystery theater. It was a murder mystery that came through that little plastic box and into my little room there, a room which I thought would be a safe place until I heard that mystery story that happened in a kid's bedroom at night. And I would be frightened. I'd be unnerved and afraid there that night, and I didn't know what to do, but I wouldn't be able to go to sleep. I had to fill my mind with something else, anything else. So I reached for the bedstand, and I reached into the drawer for a book, any book. It didn't matter what book it would be, something I could read, something I could put in my head and my spirit that would take away that murder mystery that just took place that I somehow was dragged into and now a part of. And I began to read the Bible almost like for the first time. Of course, I had been hearing it through Sunday school and receiving it, but now it came to be something different, something new. It began to be more than just a good story that was heard, but it began becoming a part of my life and therefore the greatest story ever told, ever heard, ever received. And I needed to hear it, and maybe that's why then, in that night, at that time, it became more significant to me than ever before and meaningful because I needed it at the moment. I needed to be soothed and comforted. I needed something else to come into my spirit other than that darkness that was there. But isn't that the wonderful gift of God's holy word? Comes into places of darkness, comes into your chaos, and makes life happen, and hope brings about hope. And there I began reading there in that little New Testament uh, about the familiar story about the birth of Jesus there in Matthew. And I began reading it in there, and it pulled me into it because that's the nature of a good story. It just brings you into it, makes you a part of it. Ma makes it so that you want to know what's next and you turn the page. Now that's a good story. I put it away that night, but then the next night I opened it up again. And it's interesting what happens after you do that succession of nights. It becomes a habit. When it's scripture, it becomes a holy habit. And that's a good thing. It began to stir within me and become a part of my routine and what I did in such a way that Scripture then became more than that book out there. It became God's Word in here. But it began to break inside of me and become a part of me because I kept turning one page after the other and moving inside. Well, that was the New Testament. I can do that with the New Testament a lot more easily because Jesus told these wonderful parables and he told stories that were just about people, ordinary people, you and me and life itself. And, and there was also some suspense in it there was also people who were always after Jesus, and, then, and, and there was, there was the, the horrific moments and times of, of those last, that last week of his life and the cross that's there and the wonder of a resurrection. Of course it draws you in, a wonderful story told. But when you begin hearing it personally, it becomes even more relevant. Well, that was the New Testament. The Old Testament still seemed far and away. It really wasn't until I went off to seminary even after college, then that somehow the Old Testament became a little bit more meaningful. No, a lot more meaningful. 
Because before that, the Old Testament was, in the beginning, God created. And that's intriguing, isn't it? That's something that does draw us in with our imagination and with our wonder. But then eventually you come into Exodus, into a place that kind of bogs down and slows down and just kind of lost me as a youngster. And sometimes it could even do that even now. In Exodus, reaching into Numbers, reaching into Leviticus, where do you go with that? At, at, in time, that became dismissed then and tossed off to the side as a youngster. Because the Old Testament, that certainly is a book lost in time, a culture and a people long time ago. And whatever would it have to do with us here and now and today until I met Bill Powers. Dr. Powers, really, I knew him I, because he was a seminary professor of Old Testament. And I began to realize the magnificence and the power of God's holy word through him because he began to tell the stories of Joseph and of Abraham. He began to tell the stories that are here. And they began to be more than just Sunday school stories because Dr. Powers told them in a way that I knew he believed them, that he told them with a spark in his eye. He told them with, with a power in his voice. He told them in a way that I knew this man believes what these stories are all about. It intrigued me. Somebody so learned somebody with so many years of experience with him, and he's telling these Sunday school stories, and he simply told them to us in class. And he said to us, take care not to dismiss this. Don't dismiss the stories that are here. They're not just children's stories about once upon a time. They're not just stories about long, long ago. These are stories that people have told for generations. Don't dismiss them because people long ago began telling these accounts because God infused within them what God wanted them to know and share about who God is and who you are. And they began passing them along from person to person, family to family, generation to generation. So who are you to think you can dismiss what God has sustained within God's people for countless years and generations? There's got to be something here, even if it is only that, that it has endured longer than anything else. And he told the accounts and said to us, as I say to you, that when you listen to them and when you hear them, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Know that what God is giving to us is God's very nature, and that's the first thing we receive in these stories of God's saving action in our world the first thing that we hear is who is God and God's nature, and he tells us and he shares it with us. He shares it with us, the one who created the cosmos. Now that's magnificent. That is a wonder. That is humbling. That the creator of all of the galaxies that reach far and beyond anything we can ever imagine and comprehend wants you to know who he is. But then the greatest story ever told doesn't stop there. It goes even deeper. And where it goes is into another mystery. From the mystery of the Almighty God and the mystery of the entire, entire universe and all of the created order into another place of mystery in you and in me. It tells you about the nature of humankind, of our spirits and our souls, of our minds, of our lives. And it opens up that new realm of mystery that we thought that the cosmos was an incredible place that had no limits to it. And it would go on for trillions and trillions of miles out there and spinning around so much that it takes us millions of years to move through this Milky Way. But then God lets us know that there's that other mystery place that's even more incredible, a deeper mystery, and it's in you. And that's what else it teaches us a holy mystery of ourselves. Uh, if we think we know it all, I know myself through and through. I mean, you know, just ordinary people. God has created millions and millions and millions of us. How magnificent, mysterious wonders could we ever be? But the more we discover about our own flesh, the more we will see mysteries that are there. The more we look into our, the cells of our own beings, we can even see there that within that cell structure that's there and the atoms that are there inside of us, we discover even more. And then when we think we've got down to the very smallest place, we can see then that there's even something more incredible. 
It goes from the vastness of space to the very smallest place in our own beings, that in our molecular structure, that there's this cosmos and this space that's a vastness within us. That's just in our physical bodies. And then there's that deep mystery of human nature. There's that deep mystery of what God said when he put us there in the garden. I'm making this bundle of appetites, Dr. Powers said the Hebrew really is all about. I'm creating this bundle of appetites and putting them in the garden. And that's us, isn't it? Isn't that you, a bundle of appetites that just seems to sometimes have craving for more? Now, that craving for more can be more God. The craving for more can be more love. It can be more of wanting to just take in everything that God gives to us and just soak it up. When you hold that newborn baby in arm, you just want to hold that moment and, oh, God, maybe just stay right here forever. And you just want to soak it all in. A little bundle of appetites are you, is that little flesh, that little one in your arms. But then that bundle of appetites somehow spins out of control. And that's what happens. And that's what the story tells us. It tells you about the very nature of who we are when we spin out of control, too. And we, too, spin into that place of darkness. Chaos, just like the cosmos did. But then remember what the story tells us is that God created out of this darkness, out of this void, out of this chaos and brought it all to order, brought it all into his being and made life happen. And then the same happens inside of you. Now that's a wonder and that's a mystery. From the vastness of the cosmos all the way down to your individual, my individual life that God knows us and that God has us that into the mysteries of who you are. Now, who wouldn't want to know more about that story? And that's what's here. But then there's more. The mystery goes on. All the way from the vastness of space to the very depths of your soul. And then into a future that's ahead. Because through this account, through all of these stories of salvation that we hear today and through this season of Lent, we will hear God, how God has a plan for us. God has created us for this purpose, that God has a design for us in life. When we see that and become a part of that, as it's revealed to us in the Holy Word, as it's revealed to us in the greatest story of God's saving action in this world, we begin to see a head and a future. And in that we have hope, and in that we know that God is bringing us to a life Jesus is the one who really helps us to see this. He's the one who really helps us to see heaven, who really helps us to see God's kingdom here and among us, and to be a part of it. It is Jesus who comes teaching us this kind of a way, a way that God is now and is taking us into a new day, a new creation that's emerging around us and in us, through us, that God is taking us ahead in this created order, that the, all of the cosmos that we might think is spinning out there and there's not a control of it because it's just whirling through space, but it's not so. God's hand is upon all of creation, the vastness and the most intimate place. And God knows us and leads us forward. Hear that account and that which Jesus said from John in the third chapter. You know it. We all know it so well. It's that memory verse that we had that I had too when I was a kid in Sunday school and it was only on Sundays that we pulled out that Bible until it becomes more, until it becomes personal, until it becomes God's word for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever and everyone who believes in him may not perish but will have eternal life, life everlasting. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The word of God for us all, saving us for life, always, lifting us up to a new life. Discover that word. Discover God's saving word for all of us.